We were born in a compound, but we were born in a compound in our mind. Mm -hmm. We robbed the Goodwill boxes. We dumpster dived for food. The bread they couldn't sell, and it was intended to be animal feed. Oh my goodness. This was the kind of life that we had. So I find this book. And I didn't know I was in a cult until I looked at the title. And it's like The Prophet of Blood, the untold story of the family of Ervil Baron or something like that. And I'm reading this book shocked. It's unbelievable. The hiding, the FBI raids, the lying, changing your names, running in the middle of the night, being left in Mexico, back and forth, every horrific thing we had endured. All of a sudden, the puzzle makes sense. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation. I love seeing those words of encouragement for our guests. They are risking a lot by coming on and telling their stories. And so we love to see when you guys support them. So today's guest, we found her actually just before this Hulu documentary came out. A few of you have been reaching out to me already saying, please do something on the Daughters of the Cult. It is about the LeBaron Group, which is a fundamentalist Latter-day Saint group, a fundamentalist Mormon group who does practice polygamy. And we are going to be talking about the ins and outs of of how they were on the run from the law, how the leader was ordering hits on people through these theological reasons, the blood atonement, which we'll get into. And if you follow the channel, you know what that is, but we'll describe it for anyone who's new here. And so thank you so much for joining us, Anna LeBaron. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's an honor to get to talk to your listeners and, and say my story, tell them my story and, and connect with them in this real important way. Yeah, well, we thank you for spending the time and we are doing an interview with your sister Celia. We have, once this airs, we will have already done a live together. And so we really appreciate your time coming on and sharing. And for those who want to learn even more, obviously you can watch the documentary on Hulu and you can get Anna's book, The Polygamous Daughter. Is that on Amazon? Where can people find that? It's on Amazon, but we prefer people go to independent booksellers for that if you have one nearby. You can also get it at your public library. They can use interlibrary loan if they don't have it on the shelf. And if you have Audible you, and you have Audible Plus, you can listen to it without even spending a credit. I read the Audible edition and just a fun fact, I had to audition to read my own book. <laughs> <laughs> I totally believe it because as an actor and I've done voiceover acting auditions before, I 100% believe that they made you do that. <laughs> <sighs> it was a whole thing, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. The audio world is no joke. It's so much harder than people realize to do voiceover work. But yes! well done. Congrats. Congrats on doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you've been so busy lately with all of the press coming out, especially with this documentary. And so one thing that I noticed, the documentary did a great job, by the way. It was beautifully shot. Uh, it was very cinematic. It told the story. We're on the edge of our seats. We're like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? It's like true crime playing out in front of our eyes yeah. in real time. But one thing that I wish they had more of was more of your specific story, your your specific perspective, things that you had to deal with. And I know they couldn't get everything in five episodes, but that's why we're having you on today to talk about the things that they did not get in the documentary, as well as adding some context that was in the documentary. Yes. With that said, I guess let's start from the beginning and I'll just give a brief overview. Correct me if I get any of the details wrong, mm -hmm. but for those who aren't familiar, with my channel or the fundamentalist Mormon group, I just want to point out that in the early days of Mormonism, when polygamy was going strong in Utah, the second prophet Brigham Young had founded Utah. Um, the government came in a few times. They're like, you guys can't be doing this if you want to be a state. And they're like, no, we still want to practice. There was this big thing back and forth with the government. Finally, in Wilford Woodruff's time, he was the prophet 
Then he said, okay, fine, we'll stop so that you guys will leave us alone. They continued to practice in secret for a few years. But around that time, a lot of these breakoffs started happening because people were saying, no, Joseph Smith, the original prophet, said that polygamy is the only way to salvation. It's the only way to the highest level of heaven because there are three levels in Mormonism. The highest level is called the celestial kingdom, which we'll probably mention throughout this. And so this is my take as growing up mainstream Mormon. I wasn't really aware of all the fundamentalist or the polygamist stuff happening even in the past to the extent that it did. Now that I've left, I've learned everything or at least most things. And now I'm learning more about these breakoff groups. So the LeBarons were one of those breakoff groups who wanted to continue practicing polygamy, living the fundamentalist rules of Joseph Smith, of Brigham Young, and one of those was the blood atonement, which to my understanding was if someone was refusing to repent, you had the right to what Brigham Young said, slit their throat, spill their blood on the ground, and they would that would be their atonement. So murder in the name of God, which is obviously really dangerous and not okay, but they took this to the extreme. So Ervil LeBaron was your dad, Anna, and he was the one who kind of even splintered off from another group and was like, no, I'm the real prophet. I'm the one mighty and strong, which came directly from the scriptures as well. Mm -hmm. And he self-appointed himself as the prophet and the one who had the authority to ask people in the group to carry out these murders with the guise of blood atonement. So did I miss anything? You did miss one little thing, but oh my gosh, okay. how you covered that was amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Wow. Okay. So the one thing that you did miss was that Joseph Smith said, this doctrine shall never depart from the earth. Okay. So when the LDS church disavowed polygamy in 1890, um, they were removing it from the earth, mm. which is not what Joseph Smith taught. Right. The other part that you might not be aware of is that in addition to the doctrine of blood atonement, in addition to the law of plural marriage, which is polygamy, there was also another one called spiritual adoption that was very sacred and spiritual, a, a spiritual thing that you could do, like just being sealed in the temple. Right. That's how serious they took it. And if you want to talk about my family history, you have to go all the way back to a man named Benjamin F. Johnson, who was Joseph Smith's spiritually adopted son. Interesting. Joseph Smith adopted him into his family as his son. So in my mind, even though I don't believe that those um, ceilings and ceremonies actually have the effect in the afterlife that they claim, um, I do claim because it's just a little bit weird that I can say I'm the spiritually adopted great, 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 great granddaughter yeah. of Joseph Smith. Yeah. Like, wow. <laughs> you know, and I want to also make sure and say it was the mainstream Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that's what they want to be called. So I want to be respectful of that. We can say LDS if that's easier. LDS. Perfect. But, but they do like the whole name to be spelled out. So I try to do that at least at the beginning. And then we can say LDS. But they disavowed polygamy in 1890, and it was my ancestors on my father's side who took their family to Mexico to settle there in the early 1900s so they could practice polygamy without interference from the government. Mm -hmm. And there's even a society of friends, I think it's called, that were several polygamists that were continuing the doctrine so that it would not be removed from the earth that claim that uh, whoever it was in charge, you said his name, Woodruff. Wilfred Woodruff, yeah. The Society of Friends, I think it's called, um, Celia would know better. They, they had an agreement, like, we're going to say no to polygamy as the mainstream church, but you guys go down to Mexico and colonize it and settle there and keep this doctrine on the face of the earth, but we can't acknowledge you. Mm -hmm. That's their story. Now, of course, I wasn't born, so... I, do, I am not firsthand. These are stories that have been told 
And so I just want to put that out there so that people understand a little bit of the history and a little bit of my background. Yeah. I'm a first generation monogamist on my father's side. Wow. Back to Joseph Smith. That is so wild. And you know what? I want to corroborate your story, actually, because just yesterday or two days ago, I was looking on the official church website of the LDS church, and they do say within the polygamy history that there were breakoffs that went to Mexico and Canada to continue practicing polygamy. So they even acknowledge that on their website. Yes. Again, this is a long history. This is uh, over 100 years, almost 100 and. 50, 135 or so, that my family's been in Mexico and I was born in Mexico in in the LeBaron colony down in Chihuahua, Mexico in 1968. Mm -hmm. So it took a lot of years and a lot of generations before I came along, but I was one of the last of Ervil's children to be born in the LeBaron colony. Right. So Ervil had 13 wives, right? Well, when we were creating the documentary, we found out about a 14th, but she was only married to him a very short period of time. Okay. So some people don't count her. And like I said in the documentary, polygamy, polygamous math is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, I think they did a great job of showing the family trees and the branches that connected. And it mm, it was really yes. interesting. I'm definitely a visual person. And so it really helped when I saw everyone and they would highlight certain names. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. So, all right, let's talk then about your childhood. Because if Ervil was your dad, you didn't know a time before he took over and before things started to change. One thing that really stood out to me was that you mentioned and you actually hadn't even met him until you were nine years old? Correct. Wow. The rift between my dad and Joel is is the, is the where this story actually starts. Mm -hmm. And that was in the late 60s. And again, I was born in 68. So the rift between my father and his brother, Joel, his brother, Joel, was the prophet of God. And Ervil was not at the time. And then as they... You know, it became a modern day Cain and Abel story with my father being the modern day Cain. Mm -hmm. My father split off from Joel and started his own church. And then because my father was now the one mighty and strong, um, he can't have Joel being the one mighty and strong and claiming that position. And so obviously when you're a prophet and you are the true prophet of God on earth and somebody else is claiming they are, then they're, they're obviously a false prophet, right? Yeah. Can you hear my sarcasm? You know, <laughs> we do a lot of air quotes on this show. <laughs> and I don't mean to make light of this because my uncle Joel lost his life yeah. at my father's hand. But at the same time, there's just a lot of irony in what we're discussing here. Yeah. And, and it is a painful subject for so many people. And so we want to be as respectful respectful as we can in correcting these narratives that are out there, which is the reason we did the documentary, mm -hmm. without also at the same time re-harming the people who were the victims yeah. of the things my father did. So so there's just this really fine line that we're walking here. And, and I hope that people will forgive and be kind if we overstep one way or the other, because this is just a very fine line. Yeah. And it's a tight rope to walk. And that's incredibly considerate of you, really, because you're also coming from the perspective of a survivor, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. You're not just a random person telling a story. And so sometimes we do laugh through our traumas mm -hmm. and there's nothing we can mm -hmm. really do about it. I've been accused of that sometimes. Like, why is she laughing? It's honestly, I swear, it's part of my Mormon upbringing of like, just smile and everything's fine. And so mm -hmm. sometimes it comes out on the hard topics. And it's, I mean, we do our best, but I appreciate you saying that you do want to be respectful. One of the ways that somebody said it the other day that was really specific was they called it having grave humor. Mm. And I thought there is not a better way to put it. Yeah. Because it is so serious. And these are matters of life and death that we're talking about. And so I want to be as kind as I can at while at the same time demonstrating that all of Ervil LeBaron's children were also victims 
even though they went on to commit some very heinous acts. Right. It can be both at the same time. We've interviewed people, the same situation where the victims become the perpetrators. It's this vicious cycle. They were groomed to do certain things. Sometimes they didn't have a choice. A lot of times, and I feel like that was very clear in the documentary, they didn't have a choice. It was either they go and kill someone because Ervil told them mm-hmm. to, or they are killed themselves. Correct. And so a lot of times it's through self-preservation, and it's really hard to distinguish victim and perpetrator in these scenarios, mm-hmm. but I think that they can be true simultaneously. Yes, two things can be true at once. And, and it is a fact that at the time that they did the things they did, most, if not all of them, truly believed they were doing God's will. Mm-hmm. And I want to say very firmly, and they, they'd said it at the end of the documentary as well, there is nobody, not one of Ervil LeBaron's surviving children, believe that Ervil was a prophet. They have disavowed his doctrines and teachings. Every one of us, even the ones that are serving life sentences in prison, really have disavowed everything. You saw that my brother that's serving a life sentence in prison wrote letters asking forgiveness Mm. from some of the victims and on the documentary they granted it to him we did not expect that celia and i watched it with just like oh my gosh because now we didn't see it ahead of time we binged it along with the rest of america Mm. and we were sitting there speechless from the beauty of it. We were not expecting that. And it still, (sighs) I'm feeling emotional. Just remembering it. I'm sure seeing that for the first time and seeing everything play out in five episodes, basically your entire lifespan and how it came together Mm -hmm. and the resolution Mm -hmm. and the consequences, taking accountability. I'm sure that must have been really difficult to watch. It was a lot to take in all at once. One of the things that in the dedication of my book, if you decide to read it. Yes, um, of course. I dedicated the book to all the sons and daughters of Herbal LeBaron. And, and I can't remember the way I worded it, but I just said something to the effect of, you know, hashing and rehashing all of our stories with one another over the years since we began our healing path. Um, has been our best therapy. Mm. The documentary does not do justice to the uh, reconciliation of some of our family with one another. The family in the documentary that's identified as the KOG, the kingdom of God, that was a splintered faction of our father's children who ended up in Mexico when the whole thing splintered after my father's death. Mm -hmm. And they ended up doing some very horrific things that taking people's lives that my dad had left in this hit list. But I want to tell all of America and the whole world, there's nobody that believes in that book of the new covenant anymore. The hit list it became known as. There's nobody that believes that anymore. Nobody is out to get anyone. There are people who were still afraid of Ervil's children after all these years. Right. And if they're listening, I want them to know 100% you are safe. It's been over 30 years since anything like that has happened. That's a generation and a half. My first opening line after the title sequence, which I loved, we were born good goodness was in us. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm so happy to hear that everyone has disavowed his teachings because from what I saw in the documentary, 
They were horrendous. I mean, it's the worst that I've heard so far, potentially, from any of the fundamentalist Mormon sects that did break off and have their own thing going. And we've mentioned the LeBaron groups before, so I'm happy that we're able to get an insider account of what it was actually like. And so with that, I want to know more about your childhood. So maybe even before you met your dad, what was your day-to-day like? What were your living conditions? Did you go to church frequently? Give us kind of an idea of how you grew up. I do recognize now that you asked me that question and I rabbit trailed. (laughs) That's fine. We got right back to it. Like it was my paying job to (laughs) rabbit trail. (laughs) So we still got good stuff in there. It's fine. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. No, let's talk about what you asked me. (laughs) I was talking about how I was born in the LeBaron colony and I was one of the last of Herbal's children to be born there. Mm -hmm. And then we left the colony when I was nine months old, along with many of Herbal's followers because of the rift between him and his brother, Joel. Mm -hmm. In 1972, so I'm three years old. And I'm going to answer your question just so you know. (laughs) In 1972, when I was three years old, is when my father ordered the first hit on his brother, Joel, and it was carried out by his right-hand man, Dan Jordan. Imagine there's a rift, so I'm a baby, and this, and we're leaving. There's a mass exodus from the colony. We have to go and, you know, find a place. And imagine all the drama that my mom is feeling over this. I mean, these are important matters to her and to all of them. So I'm three years old. When Joel is murdered, my father began life on the run from the law at that point. Everybody knew that Joel had been killed. The Joelites, as they became known, the ones who followed Joel as, and considered him their prophet, were deathly afraid of our family. And our family was deathly afraid of the authorities. Mm-hmm. So it began a whole reign of terror on both sides. And we began to live life on the run from the law. So we moved frequently. We didn't stay in one place very long. Oftentimes, you know, when I got old enough to go to school, I would be enrolled in school sometimes. And then we would move and sometimes get enrolled in school again, sometimes not. We did love school because we lived a life characterized by fear, chaos, and insecurity. The daisies did not grow under our feet. We never stayed long enough for anything like that to happen. And we we got pulled into and out of school. So our education was spotty at best. But school became a respite for us. It was like a place where you could count on the same thing every day. You walk in and the, the bulletin board looks the same and the teacher's the same and there's structure routine. Whereas we had none of that at home. Mm -hmm. And so we love school. Um, Celia and I always talk about how our favorite people are teachers and librarians because education and reading really saved our lives. But we had very little. My mom was on welfare and the welfare that she would get wasn't just for her. She had sister wives living in her home with her who did not qualify for welfare because they weren't U.S. citizens. And so my mom shared everything she had. It was a very communal way of living. So everything that came in was for everyone. So the paltry amount that she got for her brood was often shared with many, many others. And so it never stretched far enough. We dumpster dived for food. We robbed the gift the Goodwill boxes for clothing. My mom would go and buy the day-old bread at the day-old bread store, but she wouldn't get the day-old bread that was half price or even the two-day-old bread that was a quarter of the price. The bread they couldn't sell. They would split open the loaves, the top of the plastic of the loaf of bread and put them into big trash bags. And it was intended to be animal feed. Oh, my goodness. So she could get a big, giant bag of this three- or four-day-old bread for like a $5. And it would feed a lot of us. This was the kind of life that we had. And, of course, I didn't know anybody was wanted by the law. We were told we were God's chosen people, so we were being persecuted. 
and getting up in, in the middle of the night, running from the law, moving in a hurry, rarely taking our belongings with us. It was just take what you can fit in a little bag, jump in the car and let's go. Furniture was a rare thing. In the documentary, they show houses with furniture and paintings and lamps. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was wondering about that. They did their best to recreate those scenes. But I'm like, <laughs> you did not listen to us when we said we had nothing. <laughs> I wondered about that. I remember seeing a home specifically and it was like this really nice kitchen set. And then you guys had to pick up and leave. And I was like, I wonder what they did with furniture, how they got furniture, if they had furniture. So it's funny that you mentioned that because it seemed like most of the documentary, it was you guys moving. It was get into the back of a box truck or get into this or move and do that. And you're going from Denver to Texas to Mexico, like all these different places. Would you say you moved a couple times a year, like every other month or how frequent were the moves? Polygamous math is hard and it's hard to really say the timeline because everything gets fuzzy. We have sat around my, my mother's child, you know, sisters and I, my mother had seven girls, six of us one time, six of the seven sat around a table one time and we said, okay, for real, let's make a timeline yeah. with every house and every single address. And what did the house look like? We're going to create a graph. We're going to have a timeline. We're going to get this straight once and for all. What are the odds that you think we succeeded? I mean, everyone agreeing on. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awful. So enough to where no one can agree how many times, when or where. We could not put it together with all six of our brains working on it. And here's the problem. Some of these were my older sisters that were married off when I was a young girl. And so their narrative splits off from the younger yeah. siblings. Their narrative splits off and then they ended up in different houses and then we were over here going off this way and then we got split up again and these other ones got down this way and then we went over this way. And so this chart and graph that we were so going to make it work and figure it out. And finally, it was ridiculous how ineffective it was to try to do that. We didn't recognize that we were trying to do the impossible. Mm hmm. I'm trying to figure out how you guys were able to actually get into homes if there was no job history. And like, do you know how your mom could acquire these places? I, I know in some of them you said you had no running water or electricity. Like, how are you getting into these places? So the no running water and no electricity was when we lived in the LeBaron colony. Okay. So my older sister, Faye, lived there from the time she was two and she's much older than me. So um, she was talking about a time probably before I was born. Okay. This is a l big story to tell. And I think we needed really like 20 episodes to really tell it with a lot of the detail that p that humans just want to know. Once you see <laughs> something like that, you're like, I have 20 questions. I have so many and questions. And somebody better answer them. <laughs> I mean, we still have questions. We learned things about each other filming this that we did not know. And I will say a lot of people are commenting about the scene at the dining room table where we're playing cards and we're talking to my sister Faye and she is telling us for the first time in her life that Rebecca was her very best friend. Right. Yeah. That was an emotional scene. Oh my goodness. Like we learned things about because, and here's the reason why we learned that on that day is because all of our lives as grown adults, we get together and we reminisce and talk about things. And we really have to be sensitive to the fact that when we kind of deep dive into the darker stories, people are re-experiencing the trauma when they start talking about it. And so we haven't really, we have asked each other hard questions, but generally for the hardest, hardest things that people experienced, you want them to talk about that on their timing mm -hmm. when they feel safe talking about it. And generally my experience has been until people have talked to a professional therapist, 
So you don't go and try to dig for that with people that you love and care about. Mm -hmm. But in doing this documentary, of course, the interviewer asked all the questions and brought things up. And she, with, with our permission though, Mm -hmm. with our permission, she brought all this up and pulled things out of us that we had never heard before from each other. And so in that way, it was a gift to each of us. And we learned that we can ask each other these questions, these types of questions. We now have permission with each other yeah, to ask these questions and to talk about these things in ways that are healing and good with compassion and love for one another, knowing that it's just going to help each other heal more, more than we've already done. Yeah, and that's so beautiful. And I want to talk a little bit more about that real quick for context for those who haven't seen the documentary documentary yet. Rachel was one of Ervil's daughters. Who Rebecca. Was, Rebecca, I'm sorry. Rebecca was one of Ervil's daughters who was pregnant, who was killed because for whatever reasons, they talk about how she may have been mentally unstable. And it was just a really staggering thing when you realize that he's willing to do that. So I wanted to get back to you, though, on this sentiment of talking to your siblings for the first time, really talking to them about what had happened to you. I got the sense from the documentary that it's because you really weren't allowed to have your own thoughts. You weren't allowed to question. You would get struck if you stepped out of line. It was a really Mm -hmm. abusive environment, not a safe place to have big feelings. You weren't, I mean, what was the thing that your mom had said? If you feel sorry for yourself, that equals insanity. And if you're insane, that means you're possessed by the devil. Something along those lines, like in Feeling sorry for yourself is the first step on the road to insanity. Celia quotes her way better than I do. It really paints the picture of this prison that you were in, not only physically, but mentally. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about how that affected you growing up? Yeah. A lot of people currently are are familiar with the Warren Jeffs group that had compounds in Hilldale and Colorado City right there on the Utah-Arizona border. And the one that he built in El Dorado, Texas. Yes, we've just done episodes on that. Yes. So they're familiar with the Warren Jeffs and the clothing and hairstyles and that they had a compound. Well, Celia corrected me when I, cause I used to say, I didn't say, I said we weren't, we weren't born in a compound, but really and truly, if you think about the LeBaron colony in Mexico, it was a compound at the time. Mm hmm. Like, I don't know if they had fences around it and security and all that because we were too poor, but we were isolated down there by ourselves with, Faye said the closest town was an hour away and this is in the 60s and 70s. So imagine that. So we were born in a compound, but most of that, when I used to talk about it, I would say we were born in a compound in our mind. Mm -hmm. We were born isolated from the rest of the world, from any outside thought from any outside ideas, from any outside people. Uh, We were taught that they were wicked. We couldn't fraternize with the enemy. The neighbors were, were referred to as nosy neighbors because we had so many people living in a 1500 square foot house that if we played outside, the neighbors would get suspicious. And at one point that was 20 kids, right? Yes. We counted Wow! and there were 20 kids, three adult females living in a 1500 square foot house and we were not allowed to play outside. And so guess what? We got really good at cards. (laughs) And I think that's why the documentary producers had us around the table playing cards. (laughs) And that is what we do when our sibling group, my mom's kids get back together. There's several of us that make this an annual thing. And literally, that's what we do is we sit around playing cards. So would you say then within the trauma, obviously, and all the running, which is terrifying and the fear, there was still a lot of camaraderie and happiness and joy within your siblings? Yeah, we didn't grow up knowing that there was anything wrong or different about us. When you have that many siblings, you have built-in playmates, Hmm. built-in, you know, 
also built in frenemies, you know, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, different groups of us would, you know, cliques and all that sibling rivalry, the hierarchy, all of that was that's in a normal family was in this one too, just larger, (laughs) a lot more quantity of people involved. But yes, there was, um, there were siblings that got along and siblings that did not. And I forgot your question. (laughs) No, that's okay. I want to move on actually to the theology of it all because growing up mainstream Mormon, I know the early teachings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. I've talked to other fundamentalist Mormons who talk about their believings and their theology. And it seemed like this was a huge part of being part of the LeBaron group, especially with Ervil at the top as the prophet. So how much did that play a role into your day-to-day life? Were you expected to pray every day? Did you have family prayers? Did you have church in any sort of capacity? I believe when the LeBaron colony was at its height before I was born, before the rift, all of those things were a reality for people. There was church. They had a church building. They sang hymns out of the Mormon hymnal. And they used all the book of, you know, the sacred texts that are sacred to the Mormon church, the modern day church of the LDS church. The Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Praise, Doctrine and Covenants. The teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, the journal of discourses, Mm. the word of wisdom. Like I, as a 10, a nine year old in Mexico, I'm copying out of the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith in a notebook with a pen, like that's my schooling Hmm. is I'm copying verbatim like a scribe out of the TPJS. So again, when we, when the colony was in its, at its height of when it was down there in the early, in the mid sixties, that's something that they did. But again, my experience, I'm three years old when Joel is murdered And we're life on the run from the law. So really all of that cohesiveness and camaraderie and familial goodness and everything that people want to be a part of anything that you're experiencing just fell completely apart. We did not have church on Sundays, like because I was too little that the adults did. They would get together in somebody's living room and have church. But because I was little, I was just shuffled off into either the basement or left in another house with a little, a little slightly older teenager or child to watch over 20 children. Yeah. So the adults could go have church, quote unquote. I remember I have vague recollections of one of my dad's sister, one of my dad's wives teaching a Sunday school class. And we had to memorize one of the Ten Commandments, you know, and thou shalt not kill was an easy one. And she would give you a marshmallow if you said the one of the Ten Commandments. And so it's super ironic that they're teaching thou shalt not kill to the children. And yet at the same time, teaching the doctrine of blood atonement. Right. Talk about cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And it seemed like there were some some families of Ervils who were getting this sort of militia training as children, but that wasn't your experience. I mean, I remember being in people's houses and the boys would go out in the field and shoot at things. And I probably shot a BB gun before. And I did have to carry a gun when I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. I had to be taught how to use it in order to carry it when I was afraid for my life after the four o'clock murders happened. But I got out when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. The other part was my father went to prison when I was like eight, I think, or not eight or nine. So we kind of lost his influence a little bit because other people were in charge of us and other people that were in charge of us, specifically Dan Jordan, did not take that role of helping to raise us in any way, shape or form seriously. And he used us as slave labor. So he wasn't in there thinking, I need to go and teach these kids how to do things and how to blah, blah, blah. He was like, there's my slaves. He might not have thought those words consciously, but we were slave labor. Yeah. 
working 12 hour days in the sweatshop in a warehouse oh. six days a week. So there's no other way to characterize that but slave labor, child slave labor. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to get into that next. I just find it really interesting that there was really no underlying tone of theology or Mormonism, it seems like at all, because you were kind of born into this ongoing river that just swept you all these different places. And that was no longer a focus, Mm -hmm. even though that was supposed to be the focus or that was Mm -hmm. the intention of the group in the first place. So do you want to talk about then what it was like, how young you were when you started working full time? The young girls would be assigned to a young mama who had a nursing child. As soon as you were able to like hold for and care and comfort a baby, you would get assigned to a mama generally wasn't one that wasn't related to you because they didn't want you playing favorites which I still have salty feelings about. Uh Um, But you would get assigned to a young mama who had a nursing baby because that mama was working 12 hour days too. Oh my gosh. She would be off working, fixing stoves, fixing, repairing, uh, cleaning, whatever their job was. They would be doing that for 12 hour days. And I, as a young girl, seven, eight years old, would be given an infant to take care of. And hold and let it rest and sleep in my arms or whatever. And when it stirred and wanted mama, uh, the mother's milk, uh, and to nurse, then I would take the baby to the mama. And mama would nurse the baby and then hand her back, hand the baby back and get back to work. How did you feel taking on that job at such a young age? Did you like we it? Were loved you loved babies. <laughs> But that must have been terrifying, right? I love babies. No. (laughs) You loved it. We were raised around them. We love babies. And nursing was just like common. I watched people give birth. Yeah. Nursing and home birthing and all of that and mothering. I mean, they weren't mothering well because they, they couldn't. There were other sisters of my age mates. So there's three, four, five, six, seven of us that are the same age. We would all be assigned a nursing baby. We would pretend that we were the mamas and we would take them on walks and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was fun. Even though we're putting, we're being put to work for us, it was fun. I could see that. Even though it's like that should never happen. And then the other thing I'm going to tell you about working in those warehouses. You know, Celia and everybody talks about how abusive Dan Jordan was to us. Yeah. And it's real and it happened. I was a a lot younger. So I don't know that it was so egregious for me because I was a smaller child. You know, I do remember that. But, you know, if you have 80 kids, not that many, it seemed like a lot. There's 25 kids running around in a warehouse working, quote unquote, and then we're going to goof off. You know, we're going to play tag. We're going to do this. And there were times when adults were in meetings or whatever, and it was an appliance business. So there were appliances outside of the warehouse, just rows and rows of hundreds of refrigerators back to back to back to back to back in big giant rows, all different heights and colors. And you imagine it in your mind. And we're playing tag on top of the refrigerators. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that sounds dangerous. The fact that none of us ended up dead or in the hospital from an accident is just astounding. A miracle. Yes. It's astounding. <clears throat> we used to hide inside the refrigerators. Oh, and no. you're never, ever, ever supposed to leave a refrigerator with the door on because so many kids have crawled inside them and died. Two things can be true at once. It was an incredibly abusive environment, child labor. There were actual beatings happening and it was awful. And then on the other hand, you have all these friends to play with. You have these good memories. So when you decided to escape, what was going on around that time when we were child slave laborers in the warehouse again it was horrible they would feed us mush in the morning we would be there at nine o'clock work all day eat bean sandwiches horrendous harrowing circumstances that we grew up in so we were living in denver under dan jordan and it was horrible when my brother ed moved us to houston 
And in Houston, we were under Mark Schnoff. My dad was in prison at the time. So he had been arrested. Under Mark Schnoff, he was very benevolent. Even though we did have to work, um, he wanted us in school. So we worked sometimes after school and on Saturdays. But it was mostly the adults carrying the load of the labor. But we did have to contribute. But Mark paid us $5 a week on time every time. We did not get one penny from Dan Jordan often. Sometimes they would come through and give us 15 cents so we could go buy like a little lollipop at the grocery store, you know. Really? For working all day? I'm still offended. I still have salty feelings about it. I'm sure. Mark was benevolent. He was kind. He was good to us. He paid us $5 a week. I could save up my $5 a week and over six weeks go to the Marshalls and buy a pair of Gloria Vanderbilt jeans with the white swan stitched on the pocket Uh that fit me, not out of the Goodwill box. And then I could save up my $5 a week again and go to Marshall's and buy a pair of Nike two-tone brown tennis shoes, which were the coolest thing out there. Mm -hmm. And then I could save up my money and go to the beauty school that was down the road from our house and have my hair styled in the Farrah Fawcett wings that were so popular. Yeah. Because it was like $2 to get a haircut at the beauty school. So in Houston, I felt like a human. Mark gave us dignity, which we had never been afforded before. And so imagine that difference. Mark would take us to the roller skating rink every Friday night. And we got to listen to worldly music. Mm. We got to go to the movies. My mom had to wait until they were at the dollar show because she had so many kids. But we did get to go to the movies. And of course, Celia's experience is so different than mine. So our, you're, even though we were sisters and two and a half years apart, you're getting, you're going to get to entirely different narratives from us both. Well, that's great. So many things that happened to others of my siblings did not happen to me. I just tell people, I'm glad I wrote my book first because, you know, people read it. And and yes, a lot of horrific things happen to me. There's no doubt. It is real and it's true. And people have a lot of compassion towards me because they read these things that happen that should never happen to any child. Mm-hmm. But I'm telling you, if I had waited till other others of my siblings had written their books, people that read mine after theirs are going to be like, What does she have to complain about? Really? No, Anna. (laughs) Here's the thing. I have to say this, and I'm sure you already know this, but it happens a lot because people will say in the comments, I experienced horrible trauma, but nothing like this. Nothing like that. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's all relative. It's a form of minimizing. It is. It's a form of minimizing, and I get it. Yeah, because everyone's trauma to them is traumatic, and it does have a huge effect. So even though I I hate comparing trauma, it's the worst. I know we all do it. We all do it, and I do it because I'm like, I, you know, comparatively had a great childhood. I did suffer sexual abuse as a child, and I was in Mormonism, but all in all, like, I still had a good childhood. And so it's hard to like even it it almost feels insensitive to compare Mm -hmm. my experiences to someone else like yourself. Right. But at the same time, like we all have our thing that still affects us and it's still valid and it's still relevant. I was trying not to talk over you. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. What I know is trauma is trauma. Exactly. And for everyone that experiences it, I tell people, you do not have to be born into a violent polygamous cult to experience develop- childhood developmental trauma. Yeah, CPTSD. Abuse of any or every kind that some you're not even imagining and some people don't understand. There's all kinds of different abuses. Mm-hmm. Sexual, physical, mental, emotional, psychological, financial The list goes on. So childhood developmental trauma, abuse, neglect, abandonment, deprivation. You can experience those things in any family in America and around the world. 
you don't have to be born into a cult to experience those things. Mm -hmm. And so there are many people who hear me tell my story that connect to the different pieces of it and the different aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And after speaking in a public venue, for example, I'll go to the exit where people are leaving as I greet people as they leave. And there are times when I'll have people lean in and whisper, I have never told anyone this, but, and then they begin to name those things that they identified that share similarities with my story. Mm -hmm. And it's at those moments where I get to just wrap them up in my arms and say, if you can, and if you're able, would you see a professional therapist and tell them all of this? Thank you for sharing this gut-wrenching story with me that has been living in the dark inside of you for all these years. Mm -hmm. It takes someone brave and strong and true to whisper the things that happen to them to another caring, safe person. Because you're taught to put those things in the vault, never to be taken out. And it's just so unhealthy for those things. For a long time, it helps you survive to keep those things suppressed and hidden. But as you become grown and adult and you have access to resources, you have access to information and access to learning and growth resources, it becomes so powerful when you can kind of take those things and turn them into something that creates good in your life. And it starts by sharing your story with a safe person. Mm -hmm. A safe person can be a good friend that you meet for a cup of coffee, a priest, a counselor, a therapist, a teacher, a coach, a mentor, you name it. If you have a person that you trust, um, say, can, can we have a conversation? I've never told anyone this and I need to tell someone. And if you ever get approached by somebody telling you that, your responsibility in that case is to reach out your hands, put them in front of you and receive that story with grace and compassion and tenderness, kindness, gentleness, and then hold space for that person. Mm -hmm. Those are things that people did for me when I began whispering the darkest things that happened to friends. I eventually did go see a therapist and I've spent more than 10 plus years in therapy combined because I've been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress, which when I first heard the word PTSD, I was so shocked because I thought, isn't that what happens to soldiers when they go off to war and see their buddies die? That was the context for PTSD for me. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, no. Oh, my gosh. That makes so much sense based on my childhood and life. Oh, okay. I guess we have to look at PTSD and figure out how to wrestle this tiger to the ground, you know? <laughs> like. It's a work in progress. Yeah. I remember the first time I learned that complex PTSD could be, it could describe someone who grew up in a cult or in a high demand religion or anything of the sort that kind of, it's over time. It doesn't have to be one specific event that happens to traumatize you. It's the little things that build and build and build and build. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that tend to be the hardest to unravel because you almost have to deprogram your mind. And I'm glad you really talked about holding space because I think that's such an important thing. And I want to talk about this as you escaped and as you left and what this was like for you. But for me, it seems whenever I tell my story to someone, um, I don't, I'm not looking for them to give me answers. I'm not looking for them to fix me. I'm not looking for even the, the, 
tropes, I guess, that we would say like, oh, I'm so sorry, which of Mm -hmm. course everyone's going to want to extend that. I just want someone to listen and say, I hear you. And I think it's so important to have that and for other people to understand that the burden isn't necessarily on them to fix this person who's coming to you, Mm -hmm. who's opening up to you. It's just to be there and just to say, I hear you and Mm -hmm. you're not alone. And and then ask them, is there something I can do to help you and see what they mm-hmm. need? See if you, I guess I'm trying to say you don't have to offer the solution or you don't have to know the solution. If someone opens up to you, you can just be there. Would you agree? Yeah, your your presence alone, your very sacred presence alone is what's needed, is what is being offered by you. Not fixing, not changing, mm-hmm. nothing it's your sacred presence alone that is the gift to them. And I want to also say, I forgot to say it earlier, when we talked about safe people, um, one of the authors that I love the most, um, her name is Brene Brown. She has a book called Daring Greatly that shifted everything about my life. But she has a quote that I love. She says, you know, tell your story to people who have earned the right to hear your story. Mm. So, Here I am telling my story to who knows how many people (laughs) that you have listening. So you guys have earned the right to hear my story. And there are aspects of my story, though, that aren't for public consumption. Yeah. This is not what we talk about in public. There are aspects of my story that I only share in my sibling group. Yeah. There are other aspects of my story that I only share with my sister Celia, who's my closest person. She's my person, you know? There are aspects of my story that I only share with my BFF of 40 years. You know, the different people have go to the different levels. So when you decide to share your story, you don't have to share everything with everyone. Yeah. You get to decide which aspects of my story are, is this person have the capacity to hold as sacred? I think that's part of the empowerment too, taking back that self-sovereignty, taking mm-hmm. back that choice, because we we don't have that when we're in high control groups. We're told how to think, who to talk to, how to talk, how to behave, all of these things. At least in mainstream Mormonism, it was you have to confess everything to the bishop. You have to come clean and go through the forgiveness process. But when you can take ownership of your story, that doesn't mean that you're claiming, oh, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, which can still be empowering to understand that something did happen to you that was traumatic. But you get to decide how you move forward with your story, how you share it, how you transform it in your life, how you react to it. That's up to you. And Mm -hmm. I think just giving people that option and that permission is so powerful. You said it way better than I did. Thank you. (laughs) No, I was just saying yes and to what you said. So I want to talk about you then when you did make that phone call, when you decided to run, literally run away and get out of there. Walk us through what was going through your mind at that time. Okay. So you've now asked me that question three times. I really am <laughs> going to answer it now. We're going to We're going to answer it now. <laughs> so we were living in Houston. Mark's in charge. He's good. And I find out that my dad has died in prison. Now, I have a whole conspiracy theory about that. What is your theory? Do you want let's let's go on one more tangent before we go back to the <laughs> scene? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm not being a good guest. (laughs) No, you're killing it. It's great. Let's do it. Let's take me down that road. Anybody can go and Google the New York Times obituary that was printed about my father. You can read it with your own two eyeballs. So it's not really a conspiracy. Okay. A guard was interviewed and he said he died by suicide by punching himself in the throat. Mm -hmm. Really? Not one single medical person I've ever talked to, anybody involved in the mortuary business, no investigator, no police, law enforcement. Everybody like looks at me like, what? He punched himself in the throat? Is that even a thing? Yeah. So, so this isn't really just a wild grasping at straws conspiracy theory. And I realized those are out there. 
when I was 12 years old and I got the call and I was on the phone when my mom got the call actually and heard that my father died, the kids were whispering and talking and saying that the human remains get cold. They, my siblings told me they get cold after they die. So at the funeral, I'm a 12 year old. I've spent time with my dad two times. I don't have an emotional connection to him. So I'm at the funeral going, I wonder if it's true. So I walked up to the casket and I reached my hand in and touched his hand. And sure enough, they were right. It was cold. But then all the other adults that are with me, this is their prophet that's died. So they're like leaning over the casket, kissing his forehead. So I go very respectfully trying to just mimic the adult behavior, you know, uh, so I don't look like I'm there on an, as, as a little child sleuth, you know. <laughs> um, so I go up and look at his face and his neck is bruised. Mm. I noticed this as a 12 year old. His neck is bruised and there's makeup over the bruising mm -hmm. and the white collar on his shirt had makeup on it that imprinted itself in my mind. And I never thought two things about it ever again until I read the New York Times obituary. So you put two and two together and tell me if you believe his death certificate, which says he died of heart disease. Okay. So are we thinking that someone else punched him? Are we thinking that he tried to hang himself? What what are you thinking? He was taken out. Strangled. Okay. That's that's what I thought too. But of course, I, I don't know. I'm just a spectator watching a documentary. I'm like, hold on. So If you listen to the documentary, his own attorney was like he was not suicidal. Yeah. He knew he was going to beat this. He had beaten the char If you watch the documentary, you you know he's beaten these the law and beaten these charges. He beat the charge of having his masterminding his brother's murder. Yeah. He knew he was going to get out of this. His attorney says he wasn't suicidal. Okay, so now we can go back. Now my, okay. we can be done with my conspiracy theory. <laughs> okay. I mean, we're not unhappy that he died. He had to be stopped. Like, there was so much so much pain that he's, he was causing others. And so is it wrong that somebody did that? Yes, of course. But also... Our story is very complicated, very dark, mm -hmm. and there's layers to the emotions and to the conflicting feelings that are possible in this multi-layered story that goes on for generations. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can put a finer point on it than that. <laughs> so my dad dies in prison and Dan Jordan is in Denver where his business has failed because his slave labor left to Houston. And so Dan Jordan convinces my mom that he's the new prophet and that Mark is putting Ervil's children on a path to hell because he lets us go to the movies and watch television and, you know, listen to the radio. And my mother believes him. The best life we had ever had was slipping through my fingers. Yeah. And I could not believe my mom was going to take us back to Denver to slave labor again. So Mark's wife, Lillian, is my half-sister. They were married, had five kids at the time. They were the ones in charge in Houston. So I slipped away one day and called my sister and said, I don't want to go to Denver. Like I'm having this whispered conversation in the bathroom with the phone that you had the big long cords. You know, today we have our phones. They're not connected to anything. I took the big phone from the hallway into the bathroom to have this secret conversation with Lillian. And she said, start walking. And so I hung up the phone and walked out of the door. I had my Gloria Vanderbilt jeans on and my two-tone Nike tennis shoes with my feathered hair. And when they did the documentary, they did not recreate that. So now we know the real visual. <laughs> <laughs> have in your mind when you're seeing that scene, Gloria Vanderbilt jeans and this little girl, 13 year old girl, it's just hot stuff uh -huh. walking away because she has a little piss and vinegar in her. And she's still mad at Dan Jordan for not paying her the $50. He promised us. Oh, I remember that. From yeah. The documentary. That was awful. That was like still burning a hole in my soul of bitterness and injustice. Yeah. That it, people like, why did you run away? I'm like, because I was bitter, 
at the injustices that we experienced under Dan Jordan. Yeah. And, and did not want to go back to that. And then you have also have to think this didn't get conveyed in the documentary. We were split up and moved around like chess pieces on a board. Constantly. People came and went all the time. Siblings included. All the time, back and forth. I talk with my hands. So your people on internet, on Google or YouTube are going to be like, can she just put her hands down for a second while she tells us a story? It's fine. (laughs) So we were moved around like chess pieces. So in my mind, I wasn't even trying to escape a cult, even though that was the result. I didn't know I was in one. In my mind, I was thinking, I can just stay here in Houston and nobody will care. Nobody will notice. That is really how invisible I felt. I knew if somebody saw me walking down the road that I could get taken back and there goes my chance to stay in Houston. I'm getting dragged back to Denver against my will. But I knew if I just got to her house, I would be good. Nobody would no, like notice that I was gone. That's how invisible I felt amongst all those kids and all those moving parts and pieces and the coming and going, the chaos of the cult. How I thought my mom wouldn't notice just gives you an idea of how neglected we really were, Mm -hmm. how invisible we felt, and how inconsequential we felt. And after you left... They did look for you, but then they just left. They're like, well, I guess she's not here. I guess we're leaving our 13-year-old behind, which is also crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. And I'm fast-forwarding a little bit. I wanted to get your perspective again, because we heard a little bit on the documentary. What's going through your mind when you find this book and you realize who your dad really was? I didn't know we we were in a cult. By that time I had gotten out, Mark and Lillian were not part of it anymore. Like the whole thing had splintered. Everybody, you know, people are off in their own little groups. These other groups, there's two of them that I'm not part of that are just murdering each other. It was a bloodbath after my father died. So I wasn't part of that. So I'm just living my life with Mark and Lillian. They had enrolled me in a little Christian school. And to me, this is like, this is the best life ever. School was always so important to me. And so I'm living with Mark and Lillian. I'd been living with them for several years. And I was Lillian's right-hand person. I did laundry for them. I helped tend the kids. I cooked. I cleaned. I did all kinds of stuff for her. And in exchange for like my room and board, sort of. But it was more than that because she was my sister and we were family. Mm -hmm. But again, if you didn't do what you were told, um, as some of my siblings that tried to live with her found out you had to do what you were told or you didn't get to live with her. So I knew I was walking a fine line too, you know, <laughs> like um, I did what I was told and I was happy to do so because in this little Christian school, I had met a boy mm. and I was very much in love as in love as a 14, 15 year old girl can be. Yeah. So I was like, I'm not risking getting sent back to Denver at ever. Like, I will do whatever I'm told. But I also knew that Mark and Lillian had said to me from the day I went to live with them, the minute you change your mind and you want to live with your mom, we will buy you a plane ticket and put you on the plane. So I wasn't trapped. I had the choice and I chose every day to stay with them. And because I met this boy and I was in love. So I didn't (laughs) want to go back to Denver, you know. So I find this book. And I didn't know I was in a cult until I looked at the title. And it's like the blood, the prophet of blood, the untold story of the family of Ervil Baron or something like that. I should probably know the title. And I'm reading this book shocked. It's unbelievable what I'm reading. But at the same time, Everything about my chaotic life filled with fear, chaos, and just every horrific thing we had endured, all of a sudden, the puzzle makes sense. Yeah. Like all these pieces scattered around that have no 
connection one to another, like what is happening? You, you dump the whole puzzle out and, and you don't have the top of the puzzle board to see what's the picture, you know, mm-hmm. reading that book was like seeing the, the picture of the finished puzzle. Oh, everything makes sense now. All the running, the hiding, the FBI raids, the lying. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. I don't know. Being taught to say, I don't know to everybody and everything. The nosy neighbors, the changing your names, running in the middle of the night, being left in Mexico, back and forth. What was happening to Rena and Ramona in Mexico and why I was living with them in Mexico and what they were doing down there. They were in hiding from the law. Yeah. I didn't know any of this. And it all made sense. And at the same time, it's like somebody watching this documentary. Like it's a lot to take in. Yeah. I had no capacity as a teenage girl to take in all of that information and process it in a way that could produce a healthy outcome on my own. We had not been trauma informed anything. Mm-hmm. The the word trauma informed hadn't even been invented yet. And so I'm reading this book, taking it all in and you know you like that feeling you get when the blood leaves your body. Oh yeah. And adrenaline starts running and coursing through your veins. And you start shaking because your body's trying to process the adrenaline. Mm -hmm. That was my experience. My blood ran cold. And I'm stunned and shocked. And have no one to go to to process this with. Did you not feel safe to go to Lillian and talk to her about it? Mm -mm. I didn't feel unsafe living with Mark and Lillian. But I also didn't feel free to go talk to them and say, are these things true? Did this really happen? Yeah. But you knew they did because we had experienced it. You're like, oh, my gosh, of course. Of course, that's why my dad was in prison. Of course, why all these other people were tried and some of them were acquitted. And I thought it would be bold and brass of me to go. What's the deal here? There's no context in which a young girl who's dependent on somebody for their welfare and well-being to go, did you guys know this? Did I mean, the book is in her house. Of course, she knows it. You can't go and say, help me understand. How can they help me understand? They probably don't even understand. It was an impossible situation. Do you remember how old you were when you finally were able to actually deconstruct all of this information? I was 27 years old when I entered the door of a professional therapist for the very first time. (laughs) And here's, here's what happened. One of the people you meet in the documentary is my niece, Emily Shanoff. Mm -hmm. Emily Shanoff Davis, I should say. And uh, she was married to Tom Davis, her husband, in 1995. And I was at the wedding. But at that wedding, I think four of my brother Heber's children showed up with Rena because she was helping raise them because he's in prison. And I was not expecting to meet Heber's children at this wedding. But of course, it makes sense that Rena's there because Rena and Mark are, are siblings. And so this is Rena's niece that's getting married, the daughter of her brother, who's no longer with us. Mm -hmm. Of course, she's going to be at the wedding to celebrate. But she had Heber's children with her. And I was not expecting to see his children. And at this point in my life, I had completely disconnected my life from my family of origin and was creating a life for myself that involved me as a mother of, I think, three small children I'm at this wedding and I get introduced to Heber's children. And this is my brother that we were terrified of. We don't have any reason to be terrified of him anymore. But at the time I was. And just real quick, I'm going to pop in. Rena and Heber are both people who murdered on behalf of Ervil's orders. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to point that out for those who haven't seen the documentary. Okay, Mm -hmm. continue. 
I'm sitting there and at the time when I met them, you know, I like we we all love the babies, you know? We love the babies. And these were little children. And so of course I'm delighted to meet my nieces and nephews that I had never seen before in my life. Delighted. Today they're just beautiful beautiful people creating beautiful lives for themselves. But at the time they were just little kids and I embraced them and was so happy to see them. So happy to get to know them. We went and enjoyed the wedding. It was beautiful. And then I go home, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the signs is intrusive thoughts, nightmares, dreams, that kind of thing. And I I had no language at the time. I didn't know PTSD was a thing, but I went home and that night after that wedding, I had a nightmare that was horrifying and involved my brother Heber. I I dreamed he came and shot me Mm. and that I was laying on the floor dying and thinking to myself, pretend you're dead because maybe he won't shoot you again. And then you can go and check on your kids in my dream not even a dream. It's a nightmare. And I wake up in a cold sweat and a panic. And the next day I had a play date with a friend of mine. She had three little boys and I had three little boys. We met at a park and let them run around and we were just talking. And I whispered this nightmare to her. I didn't tell people about my family of origin. I probably didn't even say it was my brother. I was just, I had a nightmare that somebody came and shot me, you know, because I don't tell people about it. And she says to me, Anna, at your church, do they have lay ministry counseling? And I'm like, hmm, what? What is that? And why are you asking me this question? Because I'm not thinking anything. And she goes, because at my church, they do. And if I make you an appointment with one of them, will you go? And I'm confused thinking, what? Why does she think I need counseling? I I said, yes, like, okay. Just because she's being so kind. Yeah. And then she says, do you need me to watch your boys while you're there? Or do you need me to drive you? Like this friend intended for me to go to that appointment like that's a real friend right there (laughs) I ended up at that appointment and talked to this lay ministry counselor this is somebody that's not trained as a therapist they just are a kind compassionate listening ear you know Mm -hmm. and I for the first time in my life told my story front to back to a person that wasn't related to me. And this poor woman, I don't remember what church it was. I don't remember her name. I hope she got therapy afterwards. She says to me, she slides a little business card across the desk after our one hour session. And she says, the kind of help you need is more than I can offer you here. She was wise. And that was very me. smart. Yeah. And she says, this therapist, and she gave me the name of the therapist on the card. And she goes, she is a a professional counselor and, and it would be better if you talk to her. And it turns out this lady had done her thesis on cults. Oh, wow. (laughs) So I didn't find that out till later, but I was in good hands when I showed up at this. I worked with her for five years. That's awesome. It took me five years to unpack the trauma that I had experienced growing up. And and that wasn't the end of it, though. After I moved and got moved to a different city, I found another therapist. Uh, she was trauma informed because that's a thing now. And um, she was she specialized in trauma and worked with her for five years. So I want to tell people, if you've experienced difficult things like this, the healing process, there's no way to fast track that. Mm -hmm. I believe in miracles. And I believe sometimes people have these incredible experiences that completely change their lives. And then they can, they're like the butterfly that came out of the cocoon in a second. 
like, oh my gosh, wow. But most of the time, the vast majority of the time, healing is a long process and it doesn't help to be impatient with the process. And I'm speaking to the choir right now because (laughs) I'm the number one person who goes, what the hell? Why is this taking so damn long? Yeah. Why do I still struggle with this and this and that? And why is this still a problem for me? And why can't I blah, blah, blah? Excuse all the swears. I've been very impatient with myself. And, you know, 1995 to now is how many years? We're in 2024. Can you believe that? Yeah. That's like... Almost 30 years ago, I started therapy, and I'm still a mess in some ways. And that's okay. I found a therapist because I said, I need to be under the care of a therapist when this documentary comes out. That's smart. And I had moved, so guess what? I have another therapist. I would love it if we could normalize people finding a therapist and talking about going to therapy and And it's just your everyday average thing you talk about. I made another appointment with my therapist. You know, we talked about blah, blah, blah. Girls night out. Let's talk about our therapy sessions. Yeah. You know, PJ day. You know, let's talk about what we, what, where we're, how we're growing and what's, where we're struggling. And let's talk about, uh, that I need medication to help me with this part of the struggle that I have and depression or anxiety or whatever it is, uh, let's normalize saying it's okay to take medication if you struggle with anxiety. Mm-hmm. It's Nobody gets upset if anybody takes headache medicine or medicine for diabetes or heart disease or whatever it is you have. Nobody gets any kind of weird about talking about their medication for bodily disease. Um, can we talk about let's, it's okay to say I take medication. I do take a medication to help me. Yeah, I think it's great that you're bringing that up. And I do think that therapy is becoming more commonplace and recognized and normalized. And I do think that that's a huge reason why all of these cult documentaries have just blown up all of a sudden. People are starting to realize that they were in a cult situation and people are starting to empathize more with people who are in cult situations. And there's just become this huge awareness happening in the last, I would say, 10 years, maybe five years of people really starting to take inventory of their lives and take action to have a more peaceful life. That's not to say that you're mm-hmm. broken. And that's not to say you need to be fixed. It's mm-hmm. just what can you do to give yourself more peace, more mm-hmm. consciousness, more awareness, a more fulfilled life. And so I love that you're doing that and you're talking so openly about it. And so the last piece we need from you is just how you're doing now. What is the consciousness side of your story? Did I ever tell the whole thing you asked me three times? I think so. I think we got it. I think we got there. (laughs) (laughs) There was still a lot that we didn't get to, but that's okay. I know we're like running low on time, but I do want to know, and our audience I'm sure wants to know how you're doing now and where you're at. Well, um, I'm still in therapy and I take a medication. Like, but these are things to celebrate. Yeah. And you can be happy for me that these are things that are real for me. I have five grown children who have lives of their own and are just so proud of me for all this work of healing that I've done. They're all so proud of me. And that is probably like my number one, number one accomplishment in my life is that my kids still like me and they're grown Mm, adults. That's so beautiful. (laughs) I love that. My middle child, my son had a baby So I am also a grandma. Yay. And my grandma name is Yaya. (sighs) But my grandchild changed it into Yayi. So there's that. And I still keep trying to get her to say Yaya because I like that better. But if she decides it's Yayi, then so be it. (laughs) She gets to choose. But in the meantime, she's only four. So I I don't know if there's still time. So cute. It might be set. (laughs) I might be Yayi. And so um, 
one of the things that I talked about in the documentary that ended up on the editing floor is that I'm currently pursuing a master's degree. Amazing. In what field? And I graduate in May. Um, it's a master's degree in Christian spiritual formation and leadership. Wow. Through Congrats. Friends University in Wichita, Kansas. So on uh, in just a few days, I start my last semester. <gasps> So exciting. I am. This is just like, I wanted to continue my education. But when you have five kids and you're a single parent, it's really hard. And so I didn't do it while my kids were still young. And now that I have that I'm an empty nester and I'm a single person, I can decide to go back to school. And so I did. And, you know, for people that are thinking in their mind, what is Christian spiritual formation. What does that even help me understand? And some of your audience may be interested. So I'll say yeah. um, spiritual formation is a fancy word for discipleship. But the word discipleship is a little bit too Christianese for me. Uh, Christianese. <laughs> what that means to me is when you do things in your life and have practices and rituals or disciplines, that you would call some people call them like prayer and going to church or reading your Bible or, you know, different disciplines that people practice as a way of becoming more like Christ. And that, I think, is one of the key missing ingredients and why my opinion is that Christians really give Christ a bad name is because we're not teaching people how to become like Christ. And if you think about the message of Christ and the things that he did in the Gospels, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, people that were his disciples, and the word disciple, a better translation of the Hebrew word is student or apprentice. Mm -hmm. And if you think about an apprentice like a master a gardener, a master electrician, a master plumber, um, when they have somebody apprentice under them, the idea is to make them like them to here. Let me teach you everything I know so that you can do the thing that I do. And that's the key ingredient that's missing in churches all across America and the world is we're not teaching people how to become like Christ because the message of Christ was love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, mm -hmm. gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. If we had more of that on the internet, this place, this world would be a better place. Sure. So that's why I'm studying Christian spiritual formation is because I believe that actually becoming more like Christ in his character and his goodness and his integrity is what can heal the world, not people following rules and dogma yeah. and theology. Even all those things can have their place. The actual becoming like Christ is the most important thing. And so if people encounter me and do not experience more love, joy, and peace as a result of it be in me being in their life or me speaking into their life, if that's not the result, I'm doing it wrong. That's a lot of pressure. This world needs more love and joy and peace, but it's not pressure when you are actually becoming joy, becoming love. And my mentor, Bob Hamp, says we receive the things from the spiritual realm, we contain them within ourselves, and then we broadcast those things. And then whatever you're receiving, you're broadcasting. If you receive hate, you're broadcasting that. But when you receive love, guess what you broadcast? And it's not even something that you have to manufacture. It just emanates from you. You receive it, you contain it, you broadcast it. And what are you broadcasting with your life? If I'm not broadcasting love, joy, and peace with the very essence of my life, I'm missing the most important part of calling myself a Christian. Wow, that's amazing. 
Well, it's just so inspirational to hear all of that and especially to hear where you came from and where you are now. It really is incredible and I'm sure it's going to inspire a lot of people who watch this. So thank you so much for sharing that and your whole story and being vulnerable. And I'm sure you're just exhausted having all these people like, now tell me, now tell me on this platform. Now tell me. <laughs> so I appreciate that. But before we go, yeah. I need your Linda Listen statement, a sassy statement as the viral video with the toddler goes. Anything you want to say to someone who's pissed you off or you can go the inspirational route well listen linda <laughs> uh -huh. i've seen that video and i love it oh good okay cool what i want the whole world to know is that regardless of your family of origin and how toxic it is or your workplace and how toxic it is or whatever whatever your circumstances those things do not have to define your life. Mm. You can pursue healing and growth and a better life so that you can create a life for yourself that you're proud of uh, in spite of however much you endured as a child, endured as a married person in an abusive relationship endured as a abused employee. Those things do not have to define your life. You get to choose. You can choose. And you can take one little step at a time, whether it's making a phone call to a friend, whether it's saying I need to, I'm going to go ahead and call that therapist my friend's been telling me about, make an appointment, you know, and, and therapy isn't always accessible to people. But if you live near a university that has a master's degree program in counseling, they need people they can practice on. Mm. And even if they're not experienced therapists, a lot of the therapy that happens is what the person sitting in the chair receiving therapy is doing. And that's talking and telling their story. Mm -hmm. You're externalizing your story. It, you're taking it from the dark interior and bringing it out into the light. And that student sitting across from you that cares enough to go to school, spend their money to become a therapist, can sit there and hold space for you to tell your story. And that's really the most important aspect of the therapeutic relationship. So even if you have to do it with a student, because it's very inexpensive and sometimes free. So I'm trying to make therapy something accessible to people. And I think I got off on a tangent again. That's okay. That's great advice. Did I finish my listen, Linda statement? <laughs> <laughs> Linda, listen, your trauma and toxic environment does not have to define you. Yes. Yes. Thank I you. think that's great. Well done. Thank you again. You have been awesome. If you want to connect with Anna here, you can go to her Instagram, Anna Kayla Barron, and we'll put that in the description as well as her book, The Polygamous Daughter. Uh, you can see the documentary on Hulu, Daughters of a Cult, and we're going to put all those links below. But do you have any final thoughts before we go? I would love for people to follow me on all my socials, but my if you only can follow one person, I want you to follow my sister, Celia LeBaron. Oh. <laughs> because I want her to write a book. And in order to get a book deal, you have to have followers. So please go follow Celia LeBaron on every social media you have. Oh, that's so sweet of you. And help me help her. Like, I have enough followers, whatever. I have a book already. Follow my sister. Let's that support is so her. sweet. Oh, my goodness. And you can say you were there from the beginning. You were one of her followers that helped her get a book deal. Yes, I love that. That is so sweet. And we are going to have Celia on as well to tell her story. So we will just double down on that call to action. Oh, also my brother Hiram. Okay. I want him to write a book too. We'll put those links in the description as well. And for people watching and supporting, thank you so much for being here. Leave those comments down below, those words of encouragement. It means a lot. Our guests do read the comments, and it does help the algorithm get this in front of more people so we can add more exposure to these cults, these groups, and lend more support and advocacy for these cult members, these cult survivors. And if you'd like to support the podcast, just again, liking, sharing, commenting helps tremendously. If you want to support further, we do have merch over at 
at cultsdeconsciousness.com under the merch tab, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cultsdeconsciousness. Our newest patrons, Paul and Lindsay, thank you so much for your support. You guys can come to Costa Rica if you want to do something less culty and more on the consciousness fun side. That'll be in the description below as well. We've got a few spots left. And I think that's it. If you like this video, I'll leave two more down below that you can check out. And until next time, for all your highest excitement, be conscious and be well.